again, your neighborhood blue coal dealer brings you the thrilling adventures of The Shadow, the hard and relentless fight of one man against the forces of evil. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Friends, I know you want to do all you can to bring victory closer. That's why you put 10% and more of your pay into war bonds. And that's why you'll all want to join a different kind of 10% club and pledge yourself to save 10% of your coal. You know, coal has the tremendous job of keeping our war plants up at peak production. And besides, coal must keep our railroads running, provide energy to produce electricity, and keep countless other indispensable wartime activities moving. You can start doing your share in conserving coal this simple way. Hold your fire. Hold off starting up your furnace as long as you can. Remember, if everyone will do this, thousands of tons will be saved. Normally, we burn about 250,000 tons of anthracite per day for heating. So if we all save, we will be well on the way towards that all-important 10% saving of wartime fuel. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Crystal Glow. closely into the crystal globe, Neil Redmond. Look deep into its murky depths. What do you see? But I... I see nothing on it. Look deeper, my friend. Concentrate. The eyes are but the windows to the secret within. The picture is there to see, and it is plain. Well, tell me, Ahmed, what do you see? What I see is not good, Neil Redmond. What I see is misfortune. Misfortune? Yes. But tell me, Ahmed, I've got to know. I see a man, a tall man with blonde hair and blue eyes. He is holding your wife in his arms at this very moment. It's Anderson. Charles Anderson, my lawyer. The picture has faded, Redmond. But now, another has come in its place. Another? Yes. I cannot give you the details because the second picture is blurred. But this I can tell you, Edmund. Yes, yes, Ahmed. You are going to kill yourself. I am going to... To... Ahmed, what are you talking about? I think I have made myself clear. Oh, you're... You're joking. There must be some mistake. No, my friend. There is no mistake. But how? What? Ahmed, listen. Try to see that picture clearly. Try to see... It's too late, Redling. The picture has faded. It is no use looking any further. Well, you lie, Ahmed. Do you hear? You're a charlatan. A fake. I have a good mind to report you to the... Yes, Redmond. You were saying... That's nothing. It doesn't matter. You're acting very strange, my friend. Eh? Strange, yes, yes. I'm on edge, I guess. I... Yes. Yes, I do hear it. Do you hear what? A voice. Indeed. Yes, a voice, I tell you. I've heard it three or four times now. There it goes again. It again. It's sounding inside my head. It's beating against my brain. I... Why doesn't it stop? Why doesn't it stop? Too late, my friend. Only death. And stop it now. So this cab driver hits this jaywalker, you see, and he gets out of his hack, and the jaywalker is stretched out in the road stiff. Well, so the cab driver says, Too bad, buddy, you hadn't ought to have been jaywalking. I'll be seeing you in the morgue. So the stiff, the dead guy, you understand, mister, he opens one eye and he says, Okay, cabbie, but don't kill yourself to get there. What? <laughs> what did you say? Why, I said, I guess... Hey, I don't get it. What was what I said? Something about 
killing yourself. Oh, sure, mister. It's the gag. More. Huh? Kill yourself. You get it? A gag. Hey, mister, what's the matter? You don't look so good. Not so good. Kind of pale. Like you had the pip. Driver, if you'd pay more attention to the road and less to what I look like, I... Kill yourself. Oh. You're going to kill yourself. There it goes again. There what goes? That voice. Voice? What voice? Driver. Yeah? Do you ever hear voices when there's no one else around? Oh, sure. I hear them all the time. Oh. All the time. Hey, what am I saying? How can you hear a voice when you're alone? Unless you're talking to yourself, you're talking. Hey, look, mister, if I may presume to advise... What? If I may presume to advise, maybe you ought to see a psychorist. You know what I mean. Get your head examined. Yes, yes I'll, I'll be all right, Clive, but I... I guess... It's gone now. Well, here you are. Kensington Apartments. Yes, yes, here we are. Oh, how much do I owe you? Six bits, uh, 75 cents. Just a moment, I'll, I'll see if I've got the tickets. You'd better go in and take it easy, mister. Oh, I think I'll be all right now, Driver. I feel much better. You're going to kill yourself. Hey, mister, you kill. forgot to pay me. Hey, come back here and pay off. Six bits. I ain't hauling no deadbeats today, not today. Hey, come back and pay off. <laughs> You're late. Well, I'm sorry, Jane. I had an appointment. Downtown. Oh, that's all right, Neil. Poor dear, you look tired. What you need is a little fresh air. Suppose we go out on the terrace. All right, Jane. There. Now. Isn't it delightful out here? Yes. Yes, it is, Jane. The air will clear my head. You're going to kill yourself. Jane. What is it, Neil? Was Charles Anderson here this afternoon? Of course, Billy. Don't you remember? You asked him to come up and check your stock transfers. He just left about ten minutes ago. I see. Neil, what on earth is the matter with you? Nothing. Nothing. You're acting strangely. Am I? Yes. Yes. Neil, if you'd only tell me what... Say it goes again, Jane. What, what are you talking about? That voice. Voice? Yes. Yes. It's beating you. Pounding inside my head again and again. Oh, dear, for heaven's sake. It's following me wherever I go. It's driving me mad. Neil. I can't stand it. I've got to stop it. I've got to stop it. I've got to stop it. And there's only one way. Neil, what are you going to do? Why are you walking toward the roof railing? I'm going to silence that voice now. Neil, stop! It's the only way. The only so I am standing here in front of the apartment waiting for this here deadbeat, Mr. Cranston. I'm waiting for this deadbeat, you see, to come out. When all of a sudden he does, but from the roof. Landed in the street right next to my hack, he landed. Oh, Shrevey, how horrible. Oh, to my dying day, I will not forget it, Miss Lane. To my dying day. Oh, come on, let's have a look. That's Neil Redmond, the banker. Oh. oh. Hey, Mr. Cranston, hey. Uh, he ain't quite stiff yet. I... Lamont, uh, he's trying to say something. Yes. Uh, what is it, Redmond? What is it? Ahmed was right. He said I would kill myself. The voice. The voice that beat in my head tortured me. Now. Now it's gone. Now, uh, I don't know why you and Miss Lane insisted on coming along, Cranston. This is a police job, not a social call. Oh, come now, Weston. After all, we brought you this lead on Ahmed. You can't very well toss us aside, like an old shoe. Two old shoes, Lamont. After all, I'm here, too. <laughs> I'm painfully aware of that, Miss Lane. Now, if you'll just step aside, I'll ring the bell. Yes. I'd like to see Ahmed. Do you have an appointment? Tell him the police are here. Police? If you'll be safe here, I shall see if Ahmed is in. He'd better be in. Hmm. Exotic looking place, isn't it, Margot? Like something out of either the Arabian Nights or the movies. Incense burning, dim light, crystal glow, heavy drapes. Sure. All the regular trappings of the phony. Maybe, Commissioner, but I can tell you one thing. This stuff never came out of any bargain basement. Well, he can well afford it, Margot. They say his fees are tremendous. Well, here he comes now. Good afternoon. I am Ahmed. I am Police Commissioner Weston. 
It's Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston. How do you do? How do you do? I must say, this is an honor. A visit from the police. Never mind the heavy humor, Ahmed. Neil Redmond jumped from his penthouse terrace an hour ago. Committed suicide. Does that mean anything to you? Why should it, Commissioner? We have reason to believe you had something to do with this suicide. Really? And what do you draw that conclusion? The dead man had a slip of paper in his pocket with your name, address, and time of appointment. Mr. Redmond did consult me this afternoon, but that proves nothing, my dear Mr. Cranston. Well, maybe not. But it so happens that he mentioned your name and something about a voice just before he died. Hmm. Very interesting. But it proves nothing. He also said that you knew he was going to kill himself. Excuse me, Commissioner. Miss Lane. Yes? Does something interest you in that other room? Why, why, no. I was just admiring your grapes. Thank you. But I would rather you admire them another time, if you don't mind. Why, why, no, I don't mind. Now, Commissioner, you were saying... I said you knew Redmond was going to kill himself. Yes, yes, that is true. Just how did you know, Amit? I have occult power, Mr. Cranston. I can foretell the future. I suppose you saw Redmond's death in your crystal globe. Precisely, Commissioner. Well, I don't believe in this poppycock, precisely. You know more than you're telling us. Every man is entitled to his own opinion. Now, if there is nothing else... Not at the moment. But I warn you, don't try to leave town. We may want to see you again. I will be here... Good day, Commissioner. Phew. I've got shivers running up and down my back. Lamont, Commissioner, did you hmm. notice Ahmed's eyes? Yes. They were dead. Lifeless. Like the filmy eyes of a snake. No color or light. Phew. Commissioner, it gives me the creeps just to look at them. Well, I'm not interested in the fellow's eyes, Miss Lane. I'd just like to know how he ties up with Redmond's suicide. Well, we really haven't got a thing on him. Uh, that's true, Cranston. And I'm convinced that fellow's a phony. Uh, yes, he's clever too, Commissioner. Clever and dangerous. Ah, Mrs. Redmond, it was good of you to come. Why did you insist on my coming down to your studio on the, on the very day of my husband's death? I was so shocked to hear the news. Believe me, Mrs. Redmond, here, please, sit down. No, thank you. Let's drop this act. You know very well why you're here. Now, did you bring the money? Money? Yes, $20,000. Remember, we made a bargain. I was to drive your husband to suicide so that you could inherit his fortune and marry another man. And the price was and is $20,000. I'll give you $10,000, no more. The price is $20,000, Mrs. Redmond. Don't be a fool, Ahmed. You better take what I offer you or you'll get nothing. You have no way to collect and you don't dare go to the police. I see. Well, Mrs. Redmond, you win. I might as well accept your offer in good grace. I knew you'd be reasonable, Arnold. My dear lady, I have no choice. Well, I must be going. I'll send you the money in the morning. Oh, no, no, don't go yet, Mrs. Redmond. I want to make amends for my rather rude behavior. Let me read your future while you're here. Uh, No, thank you. It will take but a moment. The crystal globe is lighted. Here, Mrs. Redmond... Look into its depths. No, no. Look deep into its depths, Mrs. Redmond. No, no, I won't look. Oh, yes, you will. You cannot help yourself. Look now. Look deep into the globe. There is a picture there. No, you're not going to do to me what you did to my husband. Yes, there is a picture there, Jane Redmond. A picture of your death. You're lying, lying. Your future is clear. You are going to kill yourself, Jane Redmond. You are going to kill yourself. No! 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 Now, ain't that just like a woman right in the middle of rush hour traffic and she don't look left nor right? Hey, lady, be careful. You want to get killed? I'm going to kill yourself. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to kill yourself. I'm going to stop that boy. Come on, baby. Friends, your patience and cooperation in ordering coal is so necessary this year. First, there are more deliveries to make now than ever before because many homeowners have converted from oil to coal. 
In addition, your coal dealer is facing an increasing labor shortage. Government regulations do not permit delivery of your full winter supply at once. So do not ask or expect it. Rest assured, your dealer will see to it that your immediate needs will be taken care of right through the season. And remember, when placing your order, our government urges you to be a 10 percenter and save at least 10 percent of your coal for victory. Here's a tip on how to do it. Install an automatic regulator. A number of automatic heat regulators have been released and are available now, without a priority, at your neighborhood blue coal dealer. The cost is low, and the saving in coal and money is substantial. And what a difference in comfort with the temperature at just the right level day and night. Yes, an automatic heat regulator will save you countless trips to the basement and protect your family against colds due to improper heating. Call your friendly blue coal dealer and order your automatic heat regulator tomorrow. Now, back to the shadow. I don't get it, Cranston. First, Neil Redmond commits suicide, then his wife does the same thing a few hours later. A block from Ahmed's studio. Mm. You insisted on coming in on this case, and now all you can say is, hmm. Fine help you are. Haven't you got any ideas? Oh, a few. But you wouldn't believe them, Commissioner. I've got an idea, Commissioner. Oh, you have. Yes. Don't you think Ahmed might have murdered the Redmonds by some kind of hypnotic remote control? Remote control? Rip? Oh. Look, Miss Lane, I don't want any crackpot theories. I want evidence. Evidence that I can put before a jury. Wait a minute, Commissioner. Don't get excited. I think Margot here's on the right track. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. And I've got another idea. Oh, you have. Well, what is it? This one is my secret, Commissioner. I came back to look at the drapes you have here in the studio, Ahmed. They're beautiful. Thank you, Miss Lane. Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry I spoke to you so sharply the last time you were here. Oh, I didn't mind. Now then, what can I do for you? Well, I'm doing my house over, and I'd like to get a set of these drapes, if it's at all possible. Well, Miss Lane, you see, these drapes are imported from Iran. Oh. Naturally, with the war, I'm sure you understand, Miss Lane. Oh, of course. I knew there'd be a catch somewhere. Well, I must be going. You've been very kind. Oh, uh, just a moment, Miss Lane. Yes. While you're here, why not let me tell you your future? Hmm, Mind if you do. I don't know whether I could pay your fee, though. For you, there will be no fee. Here. Sit here, Miss Lane. Thank you. Now, look into the light of the crystal globe. Look deep. Hmm. What do you see? Nothing. But you know I have the strangest feeling. I see nothing. And yet I can't look away. Look deep, Miss Lane. Look deep into the crystal globe. This is... This is the first time I've had my future told. I, I guess I'm a little nervous. And with good reason, eh, Miss Lane? What? What did you say? Oh, come now, Miss Lane. Let us be frank. You came to spy on me. No, Yes, no. yes. Mr. Cranston sent you, didn't he? No, he had nothing to do with... With what, Miss Lane? With my visit here. Now, 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 my dear lady, there's no need to be frightened. I wouldn't harm you for the world. You see, it's Cranston who's going to get hurt. Lamont? Yes. You see, Miss Lane, you are going to kill Lamont Cranston. No. Ahmed, no. Yes, you are going to kill Lamont Cranston. Kill Lamont Cranston. Kill Lamont Cranston. Kill Lamont Cranston. No. No, I can't. No, I can't. <laughs> What a crowd on the subway platform, Lamont. Margo, what about Ahmed? The subway idea of yours was a good one. For once, we'll get to the theater on time. Besides, I love subways. Margo. Yes, Lamont? The last hour, I've been trying to get you to tell me what happened at Ahmed's, and for the last hour, you've been studiously avoiding the subject. Now then, my lady. Well, the fact is, nothing happened. Nothing? Nothing. Didn't find out a thing. That's why I didn't want to talk about it. No, this man Ahmed's too clever to tip his hand. Now, hello, here comes Jefferson Express. Yes, we'll be lucky to get in with this crowd. <laughs> well, maybe a little of my old football training will come in handy now. Lamont, I... Oh, the voice again, the voice. You say something, Martha? No, nothing. Nothing. 
That train stopped about six inches away from your body. Lucky the motorman jammed on his brakes in time. Oh, Lamont, how did it happen? Someone in that crowd pushed me off the edge of the platform, Margo. Someone tried to kill me. Who's there? The window. The second attempt on my life in 24 hours, Margo. Luckily, the would-be killer missed me completely this time. Did you... Did you see him? No, he got away down the fire escape. Oh, Lamont, don't you think you ought to leave town for a while? No, Margo, I'm staying right here. But you're in terrible danger. You're you're just inviting your own murder. Perhaps. I'll never catch the man who's gunning for me if I run away. As a matter of fact, I'm expecting Weston any minute. He's going to take that bullet back to headquarters for study by a ballistics expert. Lamont, I... Something wrong, Margo? Oh, no. Oh, I'm all right. Have you got the bullet that was fired at you? Missy, it's over here, buried in the wall. See, just above the table lamp. Hello, Cranston. It's Lane. What are you doing with that knife? Cranston, look out. Margo. You've gone mad? Here, give me that knife. You turned around just in time, Cranston. Margo. So it was you who tried to kill me. But why? Why? I'll tell you why, Cranston. She's gone crazy. And we've got just the right place for people like that. Dr. Chandler, how is she? In all my years as a specialist, I've never seen a stranger case. It's evident that Miss Lane has gone mad. She babbles about hearing a voice constantly. Well, Cranston, that settles that. Doctor, did you say she keeps hearing a voice? Yes, it seems to be an obsession with her. I see it. Neil Redmond heard a voice, too. What would you say, Cranston? Uh, nothing, Commissioner. Nothing. Now, wait a minute. Where are you going? I'm going out, Commissioner, to take care of a little unfinished business. Who's there? Strange. Sure, I heard someone in my studio, and yet when I switched on the light, the room's empty. <laughs> What's that? The shadow, Ahmed. The voice. I, I heard a voice. So did your victims, Ahmed. But now you hear the voice of the shadow. I cannot see you. No man has ever seen me. Only the guilty fear me. The voice of the shadow is the voice of justice, my occult friend. What do you want from me, shadow? A confession of your crimes. I will confess nothing. I know nothing. Indeed, Ahmed. You have no knowledge, I suppose, of the little electric machine concealed under your crystal globe. You... You know that. Yes, Ahmed. I went over your whole establishment during your absence. What is that machine, Ahmed? A little invention of my own shadow. That machine illuminates a crystal globe with a deadly light called Theta Light. Theta Light? Yes, yes, my invisible friend. This light paralyzes the onlooker's brain through the nerve centers of the eye. I see. From that point on, the brain will hold the last normal conscious impression of the onlooker. The last words I speak. The brain magnifies these words, makes them a driving impulse to the subject. Yes. Clever, eh, Shadow? Fiendishly clever. Thus you drove Neil and Jane Redmond to suicide and drove Margot Lane to make several attempts on Lamont Cranston's life. Yes, yes, Shadow. And now I'm going to drive you to your death. In... In... Damn it. That drawer is empty. Empty? Yes. It was thoughtful of you to protect your own eyes from the theta light by wearing polarized crystal lenses through which the deadly light could not penetrate. You could look on in perfect safety while your victim's brain was paralyzed. Those lenses, where are they? I'm wearing them now, Ahmed. you wearing them? Shadow, Shadow, what are you doing? Look deep into the crystal globe, Ahmed. Look deep. I can't take my eyes away. I can't. Shadow, Turn off the machine, I beg of you. Turn off the machine. Try to make a murderess of Margot Lane. You poisoned her brain with a theta light. Turn it off, please. Not until you give me the antidote, Ahmed. I tell you. The antidote, Ahmed. All right. All right, I tell you. There is only one cure. The subject must be kept in total darkness for at least a week. And then? Then. Then the brain will rally and come back to normal. Shadow, now. Now, turn off the theta light. (laughs) In a moment, Ahmed. First, you're going to confess your crime to the police. 
You're going to confess your crime to the police. Oh, I'm fine, Mama. Never better. Well, what's so funny? Well, it's Commissioner Weston, Margo. I've just come from headquarters. I haven't stopped laughing since. Why? What about him? <laughs> He's a little baffled, you might say. You just can't figure it out. This fellow Ahmed walked right into his office and gave himself up. Spilled the whole story right in the commissioner's lap. Just like that? Just like that. <laughs> oh. oh, poor Weston. Moves into the electric chair, and along comes one who practically insists on sitting down in it. <laughs> I don't blame him for being upset. <laughs> Now let me present Blue Coal's distinguished heating expert, John Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts, and good evening, friend. Most people want to conserve fuel. So this evening, I'm going to tell you three easy ways to save coal. First on the list, of course, is a clean furnace. That's most important. A clean furnace is usually an efficient furnace. As a matter of fact, you may save up to 25% of your fuel bill this year by cleaning your furnace now. So put your heating plant in good working order. Second, if you haven't stormed doors and windows, by all means try to obtain them. The added insulation and protection from double doors and double windows will result in your saving a very substantial amount of heat that otherwise would escape. And that means saving coal and money, not only this winter, but in years to come, long after the storm sash has paid for itself. Third... Be sure to weather strip around doors and windows. Felt weather stripping is available and is inexpensive. It's also very easy to tack on. Closing cracks and crevices with felt weather stripping will reduce your heating bill still further. Try these suggestions. You'll find they will help you conserve important fuel by reducing wasteful heat loss in your home. I thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Again next week, The Shadow will demonstrate that the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadows' daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen. This is Ken Roberts saying, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story, E.L. W. Coal Company, distributors of blue coal.